Good afternoon. My name is Fred Phelps, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. I have the honor today of welcoming you to the first of three webinars on ethics that is a collaboration between the Manitoba College of Social Workers and the Canadian Association of Social Workers in celebration of National Social Work Month. For today's Roadmap for Ethical Responses webinar, we have over 500 social workers from across Canada connecting in. And we are tremendously fortunate to have Vicki Verge. She is the Regional Director of Social Work for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority and a very active member with the Manitoba College of Social Workers presenting to us and for us today. In terms of process for this webinar, the first half of the webinar, approximately 30 minutes, will be a presentation by Vicki, followed by a half hour question hour or period that I will moderate. Uh, during the presentation, you uh, are welcome to type in and send in your questions. I'll keep track of them and I'll begin to ask them and moderate those questions uh, after her half hour presentation. Now, without further wait, again, uh, it is my distinct pleasure uh, and to thank her, but my distinct pleasure also is to welcome Vicki Verge to present Roadmap for Ethic, uh, ethic Responses. Vicki, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Fred, for those introductions. Um, just want to thank everybody for joining us today. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Professor Alex Sawatsky and the WHA uh, Ethics Manager, Richard Lavoie. They helped me create a previous workshop that I've kind of used to um, set up our module today. So, ethics. Let's think about that for a moment. Um, what, I know we can't really talk, but if you were in front of me, what I'd be saying is, what, is, what comes to mind when you think about ethics? Oftentimes, what I hear people say is things like standards, how to act, um, what is the right thing to do, how we live our lives, our duty. One definition that I like to use is that ethics are the moral principles that govern a person or a group's behavior. Oftentimes, things like uh, synonyms like moral code, morality, values, rights and wrongs, principles, ideals, standards or standards of behavior, dictates of conscience are some of the words that come to mind. Sometimes people tell me that it, it, ethics is about what's doing right, but it's not always about the right thing. We know as social workers, we should not have intimate relationships with our clients, for example. But it happens. In Newfoundland, a social worker was found guilty of engaging in a personal relationship with a client. The Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers said in their decision dated December 5, 2016, that the social worker was also found guilty of disclosing confidential information, and he failed to complete and document client assessments. So why didn't this social worker do the right thing? As social workers, we have a responsibility to consider choices and options in an ethical way. An ethical way means a systematic reflection on all aspects of a situation, and that can help frame our practice and help us determine choices. But unfortunately, it's not going to give us a yes or no answer, and it won't tell us what to do. So now values. I hope some of you were able to take a moment and take a look at the um, pre-values, uh, pre-reading, the values um, uh, activity that I suggested um, people do. If you did do that, what you were asked to do was to rate your values on a scale and to limit those values to no more than four. Generally, when I have people do that values activity, they struggle. It's not an easy thing to do. The purpose of the exercise was really to get you thinking about what's important to you and to challenge you to prioritize those values. There's really no right or wrong values, but the way I rated my values will naturally differ from the way others because my values are a significant part of my identity. Values represent what is important to us and who we expect ourselves to be. People often judge themselves and others based on values. Values have been established through a lifetime of experiences and they come to us in a variety of ways. Our values play into our ethics. Our values tell us whether something is an ethical issue. They help us make decisions every single day and they do it we do that unconsciously. That means we make decisions without even realizing or being aware of it. 
So values are the regard that we have for something, something that we uphold. We think that it's important or worthy, something that is useful. And they guide our actions without us even knowing it. So because they guide our actions without even us knowing it, it behooves us to be self-aware and to take time to self-reflect. As we know, there are wide differences in values. So when we work with our clients, whose values do we follow? What process are you taking as a social worker to ensure you understand and appreciate your clients' values? As a social worker, it's our responsibility to understand our own values, but also to seek out an understanding of our clients' values and to understand how the dominant societal values are impacting our work. Oftentimes, we expect others to behave and make choices from the same values as ours, and this therein lies the problem. So ethics and values. <clears throat> our values influence our ethics, as I was just saying. What we believe governs our, our um, behavior. What we believe governs our choices. So where do values come from? They come from our families, our experiences. They come from society. I have an English background, and the English firmly believe that no one is above the law. How do you think that might play out in my work with clients who do break the law? Multiculturalism and gender equality are two Canadian values. But I quite wonder, do all Canadians uphold these values? And if we do, do we uphold them in the same way? What about history? What has history taught us to value, to not to value, and how has this impacted our ethical behavior <clears throat> in time and over time? If you review the Truth and Reconciliation Report, it states that over a century, for over a century, the central goals of Canada's Aboriginal policy were to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate treaties, and through a process of assimilation cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as a distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entity in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools were a central element of this policy, which can be best described as cultural genocide. In its dealing with Aboriginal people, Canadian people chose to do all of those things. Do we still uphold these values? And if not, why not? The right thing. We don't always agree with others, but in our hearts, many of us can say with certainty that there are things we would always or never do. Many of us look back at the actions and decisions of our ancestors and are horrified that they chose measures to eliminate Aboriginal people as distinct peoples and to assimilate them into Canadian mainstream against their will. Sometimes it's easy to know what to do, and some would say hindsight's 2020. There are certain things that we intuitively know are right, or are too intuitively know that are wrong. We are comfortable saying, for example, most of us would say, killing is wrong or killing is bad, but helping people is right, helping people is good. These are some things that are pretty black and white to us. So usually the right solution, though, is somewhere in the middle, somewhere in that gray space if you look at the slide in front of you. <clears throat> that space is a bit of uncertainty. Most of the time, it's hard to know what to do. Most situations are nearly never clearly at the black end or the white end of anything, and most everything falls into that gray area. So even think about murder. I re originally said that killing is wrong. Most of us would say that as a Canadian, as a social worker, I don't believe in murder. As a society, we don't even uphold the death penalty. But are there exceptions? Killing someone as a means of stopping them is allowed under our laws, but only in circumstances in which it is apparent to you at the time of the incident and to the judge upon hearing the facts that you had done something or you would do something um, to protect yourself. So suddenly that black and white is not so clear anymore. How you decide to act and how far to the right or how far to the left or how comfortable you are in the gray is often linked to your personal values. Stereotypes. I really think it's important to just reflect for a moment on stereotypes and what role they play. If you look at this illustration, it says, if a person has C 
seen an orange basketball before, they have already placed the object into a basketball category consisting of certain characteristics. It bounces, has a certain texture and groove, is spherical, and is orange. If he or she then encounters a yellow basketball, that person might be able to still associate it with the category of basketballs based on its texture and shape. So am I to assume that all balls that bounce have certain characteristics like size, texture, groove, and shape or basketballs, regardless of color? A definition of a stereotype is stated to be a widely held or conventional image that is fixed, and an oversimplified image or idea of a particular type of person or thing. But is the yellow basketball still a basketball? How do we know the yellow basketball isn't supposed to be used in a different way or for a different game? <clears throat> the NBA uses orange basketballs, but did you know the Women's National Basketball Association's official basketball is made of two interlocking microfiber panels, giving it an alternating orange and white color? However, the ABA's use of distinctive red and white blue ball uses a distinctive red and white blue ball. Much like the NBA, the standardized appearance of balls helps build brand identity. So where do our stereotypes come from? How and why do people form stereotypes? The common sense of the answer to these questions is captured in uh, social learning theory. Simply we put, we learn stereotypes from our parents, our first and most influential teachers, our significant others like our peers, and the media. Another example for how we form stereotypes comes from research about cognitive psychology on the categorization period, uh, process. People like to, want to, need to categorize the world, both the social and physical world, into neat little groups. We categorize for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's cognitively efficient. Once you've categorized something, you no longer need to consider information about each individual member or thing. You can apply all the group information to all of its members. It saves processing time. Secondly, it satisfi satisfies the need to understand and predict the world. You no longer need to wonder what each individual is like or what he or she is likely to do. All of this is contained in that stereotype. And lastly, it's a way to feel better about yourself. We think our groups are often better than other groups. So society is filled with biases which influence our judgments. So we need to, as social workers, make sure that we take steps excuse me, um, to make sure that those things do not influence our social work practice. So ethical theories. There are many ethical theories out there that exist and that can help inform our judgments about right and wrong and influence how we make decisions. Things like consequentialism, utilitarianism, I don't know if I said that right, deontology. I'm going to quickly focus on Beauchamp and Childress, Principles of Bioethics. They discuss four commonly accepted principles that outline role-specific duties that govern ethical relationships between healthcare providers and patients. But I think that they're really applicable to social work practice. Ethical choices, both big and small, confront us daily, especially as we try to provide care for persons with diverse values, living in a pluralistic and multicultural society. In the face of such diversity, where can we find moral action guides when there is confusion or conflict about what ought to be done? Such guidelines would need to be broadly acceptable among religious, non-religious, and for persons across many different cultures. Due to the many variables that exist in this context of clinical cases, the principles are not considered absolutes, but serve as action guides. So the first one, beneficence. Beneficence is considered an action that is done for the benefit of others. Beneficent actions can be taken to help prevent or remove harms or to simply improve the situation of others. Social workers are expected to work towards improving or removing factors that harm our clients. Ethicists often distinguish between obligatory and ideal beneficence. Ideal beneficence comprises extreme acts of generosity or attempts to benefit others on all possible occasions. Ideal beneficence is often unrealistic in practice, but the onus remains on the social worker to work towards what is best for the client they serve. It is expected, however, that social workers are to keep 
the well-being of their clients in the forefront of any decision that will need to be made, either on behalf of the client or with them. Hence, social workers have to weigh and balance possible benefits against possible risks of any actions. Non-maleficence. Non-maleficent means to do no harm, so pretty much the opposite or similar to beneficence. We have to refrain from providing ineffective treatments or acting with malice towards clients. This speaks both to engaging in interventions that are known to be effective, for example, evidence-based practice, and it also addresses the need for performing within one's own scope of training and one's own um, competence level. The pertinent ethical issue is whether the benefits outweigh the burdens. One of the most common ethical dilemmas arising in the balancing of beneficence and non-beneficence. This balance is the one between the benefits and risks of treatment. By providing, for example, informed consent, social workers give clients the information necessary to understand the scope and nature of the potential risks and benefits in order to make a decision. Ultimately, at the client, it is the client who assigns weight to the risks and benefits. In effect, this gets at the idea that clients, in as much as they have capacity, are to be agents of their own destiny or autonomy. The third um, is justice. And Justin is often, excuse me, not Justin, justice is often referred to as fairness. In healthcare ethics, this can be subdivided into three categories. Fair dis distribution of scarce resources, which I'm pretty sure all of us struggle with. Kind of the distributive justice. Respect for people's rights, right-based justice. And respect for morally acceptable laws, legal justice. Social justice is the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. Social workers aim to open the doors of access and opportunity for everyone, particularly those in greatest need. Let's look at this slide. The first image shows that everyone is receiving the same supports. So they're all getting a little box in order to watch the baseball game. This is equality in action. There is an assumption that everyone will benefit from the same supports. The second image, people are given different supports according to their needs to make it possible for them to have equal access to the game. So the gentleman that's tall doesn't need a box because he can see over the fence. The middle person does need a box, but the little guy needs two boxes. Would you agree that these three individuals are being treated fairly and equitably? Not everyone would agree. Some would agree it's not fair that the tall man who pays the same taxes, let's say, doesn't get any support from a box. The final image um, is about all people being able to see the game without any supports or accommodation because the cause of the inequity was addressed. The systematic barrier had been removed. When I first saw this image, I thought the middle one was a great outcome until I saw the third image and realized, oh, you can actually just change the whole fence and that would open up different options. Improve customer service. The final is autonomy. And I think as social workers, we all appreciate autonomy. Autonomous individuals can act intentionally with understanding and without controlling influences. The respect for autonomy is one of the fundamental guidelines of clinical ethics and social work practice. But autonomy is not simply allowing clients to make their own decisions. Social workers have an obligation to create the conditions necessary for autonomous choice in others. For a social worker, respect for autonomy includes respecting an individual's right to self-determination, as well as creating the conditions necessary for autonomous choice. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, you have to be prepared for when clients do not take your advice and have the freedom to disagree. Social workers are frequently information brokers, being aware of programs, resources, etc. Individuals come to us for guidance in making choices because they do not have the necessary background or information for making the informed choices. Social workers in our role as educators inform clients so that they can understand the situation adequately. As social workers, we are obligated to ensure that informed consent is provided. This does not mean providing every possible choice and option or outcome, as this can simply overwhelm and incapacitate the client. 
It does mean working with the client so they can appreciate the consequences or choices and make a reasoned decision. At times, this includes advocating for client autonomy when this is being prevented or reduced. Some of the most common and difficult ethical issues to navigate arise when the client's autonomous decision conflicts with the social worker's beneficent duty to look out for the client's best interest. For example, a client who is at risk of eviction for using street drugs in a home. In these situations, the autonomous choice of the client conflicts with the social worker's duty of beneficence, and following each ethical principle would lead to different actions. So, what does this all have to do with social work practice, and what does this have to do with you? As a social worker, you're a tool. Your values are a significant part of your identity. They represent what is important to us and who we expect ourselves to be. Our values impact whether we see an issue as having ethical consequences or not, and they help us make decisions, as we said, every day unconsciously. Ethics are principles that govern our behavior. The problem is we often expect others to have the same values, and we don't understand how when those values come into conflict, how that derails our social work relationship, assessments, and interventions. There is no automatic adherence to rules and regulations, but ethical behavior will involve the exploration of your personal value base and motivations. Ethical behavior is at the core of every profession. The Canadian Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics sets forth values and principles to guide social workers' professional conduct. A code of ethics cannot guarantee ethical behavior as it does not prescribe a set of rules for behavior. Ethical behavior comes from a social worker's individual commitment to engage in ethical practice. So as social workers, we need to look at both the spirit and the letter of the Code of Ethics and let it guide us in, as we act in good faith and with a genuine desire to make sound, uh, sound judgments. It's not always fair or equal when applying ethics. We often look for an ideal standard or model, base our approach on what is considered to be the normal or correct way of doing something. As we said, as I said earlier, ethical deliberation is a systematic reflection on all aspects of a situation. And this can help frame your practice and help you determine choices, but it won't give you a yes or no answer. In module three, I'm going to share an example of an ethical decision-making framework that can be used in different uh, practice frameworks. Perfect. Thank you very much, Vicki. That was a great presentation, and I think uh, uh, from CSW's perspective and from uh, the amount of people that are on the line, uh, understanding ethics in this kind of current political climate is something that I think is very much uh, top of mind for everyone. As we know, politically, the concept of uh, what it is to be a Canadian, what the values those are, and the ethics of being Canadian are in our news appears daily. Um, I, I, from the beginning, and so right now uh, for the audience, this is a question and answer time period. Uh, you're welcome to uh, type in your questions at, at any point. I've got a few here, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll wait for a few more to come in. Um, but um, first, to, just to answer a few questions, uh, that just a technical one for maybe people that tapped in a little bit later. Uh, the slides and this presentation will both be made available on the CSW website. We have a continuing education uh, page on our website, and both this and this PowerPoint will be accessible there. Uh, so for all those looking for that, a copy of it, it will be there. Uh, as, soon as, this, as soon as we get the recording, we will put both the recording and the uh, PowerPoint up on our website. So to get back to the presentation, um, something at the very beginning uh, struck me, and I, and I won't wrote a note, and I wanted to kind of query you on this, Vicki, is um, what, what process do you recommend I or, or, or others use to uh, better understand our clients' values? And, and I guess at the same time, how do we uh, understand our own? And I have my own idea in this, but I'd like to hear, hear from you. Well, I think there's a couple of things that we can take into consideration if we look at our code of ethics and guides for practice. One of the things that it often suggests, our standards of practice for Manitoba, suggests that we should be seeking out supervision and consultation in our practice as social workers. So that's one thing that I often encourage people to consider. Um, in healthcare, it may be a little bit difficult for some of our social workers who are working independently in sites, but they can uh, create peer groups, you know, have journal groups. Um, there certainly is the journal that's available um, 
uh, that you can get uh, articles sent to you just so that you're thinking about kind of what ethics are you're talking about it but you know the example that I gave earlier about um, the activity that I posted for people to kind of take a look at their values I think it's important that we reflect on those regularly whatever that might mean it does change over time what I value today in with my experience and exposures would be very different than when I was a bright and young enthusiastic new social worker at the age of whatever it was 21 ish um, so it's important that we reflect on those regularly and as far as clients go I mean I think we're all very good at kind of asking open-ended questions and getting to know our clients when we're developing our relationships but we do need to make sure that we're not making any assumptions and that's the time when we're getting to know our clients and doing our psychosocial assessments that we ask some open-ended questions and ask them things like what do you value the same way that we might have asked ourselves when we did this self-reflection and um, activity pre-reading what do you think okay, excellent. Uh, another question here um, you spoke earlier about uh, differing health professions and wondering um, how uh, social work ethics uh, differ uh, from uh, other health professionals um, that question coming from Sally in Saskatchewan mm-hmm well, I don't know all of the health professions, um, but I think that that's important to also, when you're working in a healthcare facility or um, working with health, you're often working as an interdisciplinary team. And so as a social worker, much like you would ask your clients kind of what their value base is, as you're developing your relationships with your team members, it's important to understand where they're coming from. Um, most of us would have, you know, things like the duty to care, beneficence, trying to do the right thing, not doing the wrong thing, causing no harm. So I think if you look at those big bucket values and principles, we all probably fall into them. But again, each individual would come with their own values and own experiences. So as you're developing those interprofessional relationships, you really need to ask your colleagues some of those questions, especially when it comes to making recommendations or suggestions for clients okay excellent um, I hope I'm asking this question correctly uh, do you think cultural relativism is a useful concept concept for social work practice hmm I would have to probably reflect on that a little bit more I don't know if I can think of that right off the top of my head sounds very familiar from some of the work that um, I would have done in my my own education but I unfortunately can't respond to that right at this moment. No, no worries. Uh, here is another one. Um, what do you do if, uh, sorry, uh, what do you do, uh, what do you do if you think the right thing according to the code of ethics uh, is against the law? Well, that would be interesting. Um, oh, very interesting. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, did I... I almost want to know what that is. <laughs> I don't think uh, there is no other response other than the question. <laughs> so um, if you look at something like the International Federation of Social Workers um, Guide to, to Practice, which is okay. um, one of the things that I looked at to kind of get prepared for this, it does talk a lot about the social worker's responsibility for making sure that they bring up to politicians their employers, to the public at large, um, the, any concerns that they might have about policies or procedures that would be um, harming, discriminating against um, clients. So we do have okay. a bit of a responsibility to do that. Okay. Uh, that there's efficacy? a follow-up to that. Um, is there room for um, extra legal, so I'm assuming outside the law, uh, social work practice? Could you say that again, Fred? Uh, is there room for extra legal? So I'm assuming outside the law, uh, social work practice. I'm, I'm assuming uh, the individual is looking for uh, uh, often uh, uh, there are differing laws that uh, we may seem as, as unethical as a practice, as unethical, but it is law. So is there room for that within the Code of Ethics to work within your practice outside the law? I think, I think that's what any. 
Yeah, I think any of our um, code of ethics always refer to the fact that we are obligated to work within our laws. Now, back to what I just originally said, if we're feeling like the law is somehow causing harm or hurting our clients or discriminating against them in a certain way, then we have an obligation to, you know, use our social justice and bring about some good ethical debate around the issue and raise that either with our colleagues or employers or politicians or communities so that people understand how it's impacting. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I have another great question here. Um, how do you maintain your ethical standards in an adversarial relationship such as what happens in a child and family services environment between a uh, client and social worker? You want me to repeat yeah. that? No, I understand, yeah. Those are really a difficult and challenging situations. I worked in child welfare for many years, and again, I think that that's part of that, getting to know your client and talking to your client a little bit about what your role is and what you're there for. So if you think about some of our um, ethics around confidentiality, certainly your clients um, need to understand that in your role as a child welfare worker, there is some information that you would not be able to keep confidential. There's some information that would be part of your assessment that you'd need to take into consideration that may or may not cause their children to come into care. So it is all about being upfront and trying to um, help your clients appreciate that although you're a social worker, you also have an obligation in the work that you're doing to do certain things. So helping them understand how um, that might play out. And then as for yourself, I mean, it can be very challenging to um, be a social worker in child welfare and understand some of the ethics and principles that you're supposed to uphold and sometimes not being able to do that. So again, seeking out opportunities to kind of uh, do some self-care, do some good supervision, reflect on um, who you are and how you can kind of find a balance between the work that you're doing as a social worker in child welfare, because it can be done and people do it very well. Now the questions are coming in more and more now, so I'm going to try to lump them together. Um, but first, uh, this one from Dawn. Thank you uh, deeply for the hours of study, thought, and examination that have gone into your presentation. You've stated the importance of self-awareness, and yet we are so blind to our unconscious biases. How can we attend to this paradox? Beautiful question. Yeah, it's very well said. That therein lies the dilemma, because sometimes we are so unconscious, we, are, we I mean, they're so unconscious, it's very difficult to know exactly what is influencing us. But I can give an example of something. I, Because I worked in child welfare for so long, I do have a very comfortable um, appreciation of what child and family services does and what their role is in society. So working in healthcare, I'm very comfortable with making a referral to child and family services, whereas I do see many of my colleagues, nurses, physicians, who are much more cautious and much more careful because they worry about the consequences, you know, the stigmatism around kind of calling child and family services. And so although that um, maybe causes conflict between me, my colleagues and, and uh, myself, it also allows us to have some good ethical debate about what we could and should do in situations because I can be honest and genuine and upfront about where I'm coming from. And hopefully by doing that, reflecting on um, my own ethics, my own values about child protection, that that can um, open up the conversation with perhaps somebody else who's maybe having a different reaction, is maybe more over in the the black area where I'm more comfortable in that gray area. So there's no easy answer to that. So I guess really what I'm saying long and short is that we need to be comfortable about talking about our values and our ethics, being aware that we often react quite unconsciously. So taking a moment to think about things, uh, slowing down and, you know, wondering why am I why am I making this recommendation to a client? Where am I coming from? And just trying to be conscious of the things that we do 
regularly. And again, you know, seeking out supervision, consultation, having peer discussions, um, being part of ethical committees. Whenever you sit back and think about ethics and maybe even participate in ethical discussions, that gets you reflecting and thinking about your own choices and your own practice. Thank you very much. I think uh, we might might have answered this earlier, but I, I'm going to combine two here. Is, uh, what if you think the right thing according to the code of ethics is against the law? And then another question of not sure what against the law means, so can you give me an example? So you may have covered this earlier, but just giving you one more kick at the can. Yeah. Well, I think that we'd all, we're responsible as you know Canadians to follow our laws and our legislation. So if we have concerns about the ethics of our practice and that bumping up against the law, then we really need to um, be prepared to state those reasons for our concerns and bring them forward to our employers, our professional associations, um, politicians, our communities to make sure that people understand what that gray area might be and what might be impacting our clients and try to um, I guess use the word fight for change or promote change or promote the empowerment of the individuals that might be impacted by whatever ethics and law are kind of um, bumping up against each other. Okay, this one's a little a uh, little different, so I'm going to make you switch gears. Um, uh, Giselle asks, asks uh, how would you approach a client who is considering euthanasia? Well, I think that's a very interesting issue in this day and age. And so one of the things that I would ask people to consider is the Canadian Association of Social Workers has kind of put out, I don't know if you call it a, a statement or a guiding statement, um, but I think that those situations are going to happen more as we um, move through our society. So medical assistance in dying, physician-assisted death, Part of our responsibility is to make sure that people have access to resources and information so that they can make an informed decision. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be the ones to do that, but we can at least in show them who they can go to so that they can hear that information, they can take that into consideration and be able to make the choice that's right for themselves. Well, what I can say is I am very thankful you're the one answering these questions and not me. <laughs> so the next question is, can you talk about how to manage the conflict that might arise when some disciplines prefer, prefer clear-cut, efficient decision-making tools and are not comfortable with the gray areas that require a more complex look and evaluation of a situation? Very good question. Yeah, it is a very good question. and. Those, I mean, much like anything that where ethics or principles or values come up, these are really hard to navigate. So I don't want my answers to sound like they're pat kind of answers, but, you know, just kind of thinking off the top of my head here, those are really the times where you're going to have to pull your teams together, uh, your colleagues together. You're going to need to sit down and talk them through. So I can think of many times in a healthcare facility, um, People may be more risk adverse to an uh, older adult, let's say, being discharged from the hospital and being able to live independently in the community with perhaps just home care or um, some supports kind of coming in, whereas other people feel much more strongly, let's say, that the person should be placed or uh, move into a personal care home. And really, as a social worker, our job is to find out what the clients want, what they, what their wishes are, find out what family may want, listen to our colleagues and hear what their concerns might be and try to mitigate kind of all of that and facilitate a good discussion that might be able to balance some of those risks that your colleagues are raising with the autonomy of what your client wishes. Not easy to navigate. All right. Uh, how might one navigate supervision consultation when the supervisor is unwilling to reflect on their own values, ethics, conflicts, and or work collaboratively, collaboratively in, in a supportive way to resolve? And I think more of the crutch of it is uh, navigating supervision cult, uh, consultation when the individual isn't reflecting on their own values, mm -hmm. ethics, and conflicts. 
Well, conflict is always difficult at any time, right? So you have to pull out your conflict 101 resolution skills, and some of it, sometimes what it means is finding some courage to be able to raise that with your supervisor, if there's safety in that, if there's some trust in being able to do that. Uh, recognize that there are times when um, it's not possible to be as genuine or bring that up with a supervisor and, and challenge them, um, and I don't mean challenge in a, in a bad way, but challenge them about that. So if there isn't the ability to do that, then I would wonder if there's a way to maybe um, seek some supervision or consultation from other team members or other social workers or from the college when, when required. Um, and using the supervision with the supervisor who maybe is not willing or able to reflect on her values and ethics, using that consultation supervision for specific activities or specific issues and using other members of your team, other members of your practice for um, different ways. Okay, I'm going to, I, I'm, I've pulled up our uh, uh, social work values, CSW uh, values, because uh, the question here is, uh, would you agree that every interaction with a client runs through the entire six values listed in the CSW Code of Ethics? Uh, so ethics guidelines, and therefore should value number six, which is competence in professional practice, actually be number value number four, which is integrity of professional practice, in order of listing importance to the guideline of professional practice. So I basically I think saying, do we do we run uh, every uh, uh, client interaction through the six code of ethics, and should uh, number six code of ethics actually be of higher value uh, than what is currently the number four? Well, I think if we put 500 social workers in a room, we would all probably come up with a different answer to that. And that goes back to, you know, some of the things that we individually value or, and um, would see as being important in our interactions with clients. So I don't think there's any easy answer. I don't think the way that the CSW Code of Ethics or Ethical Guide for Practice was written in a way that one is higher than another. There's no hierarchy to them all, but more of a, these are the things that you need to consider and uh, take into your practice. These are the values and principles that should guide your practice, things that you should be thinking about and reflecting on but one wouldn't necessarily be more important than the other. So I'm not sure if that answers or if you have a thought about that, Fred. No, I, I think that was a good way to answer. It's hard to, uh, the values are, are listed and I don't, I don't think it's uh, in order of importance. I think they're just numbered in the sense of the number of values. So uh, I think I would concur mm -hmm. with your answer. Now this one, I was, I've was i been holding off on this one because I, I think I'm looking forward to your answer. Uh, in your experience, what is one of the toughest ethical dilemmas or situations that you have faced personally? Hmm. There's been a few. I probably, um, just off the top of my head thinking here, I uh, was in child welfare and I, one of my Oh, sorry, there was a, a young baby that had been apprehended and brought into care, and um, the baby wound up in the hospital due to shaken baby syndrome. And so the social worker and I needed to meet with the mother to tell her uh, what had happened and that her child, you know, had been harmed uh, quite severely while in care. So... There was a lot of emotions and challenges going on for all of us there, but I think the hardest thing for me was when the social, sorry when the client herself um, said to me that you know you took the ch my child away from me because you thought I wasn't a good mom, and now you've given my child to somebody else who's now damaged my child and you know caused brain damage, and so just. Back to that original, there was a question earlier about, you know, your social work values and ethics and how they kind of play out in your roles in your in your employment. That was just a really hard 
a thing for me to manage as both a person, as a social worker, and then also as a supervisor because I had to help my social worker work through her own feelings and experiences with that situation. And so, you know, you think going into the work that I was doing at the time that I was doing the right thing, and in the end, this this child became very severely harmed while in our care. So it was something that was very difficult, not only in the moment dealing with the client, but also just as a supervisor and, and as a social worker, I really needed to do some work with myself and with my team around that situation. Yeah, not an easy one. Thank you very much for, for sharing your experience. Um, I have two questions that are, are, I think, fairly similar, so I'm going to try to work them together. Uh, which comes first? So the, uh, Garth and, and Kevin both kind of asked the, the, the same. Uh, which comes first in any ethical dilemma, the agency's values I work for or the social work code of ethics? And, and on the flip side, kind of the same question, should workplace or organization policy out, outweigh one's ethical standards? So I think kind of a, a fairly similar way of asking uh, the same question. Well, again, I don't think uh, that's why ethics and values and morals are so difficult because there is no easy answer. There is no yes or no. It's not that one is above the other. But I think it behooves us to be aware of where some of our ethical choices, ethical principles and values as a social worker might impact or come into conflict with um, our work. And so we have to work through those each and every time so that either, A, they don't impact our client or the work that we're doing with our client, but we just need to talk about them. So I can give an example. There are some hospitals here in Winnipeg who have declared due to religious reasons that they will not support medical assistance in dying. So for the social workers that are in those hospitals who may be approached by a client who wishes to proceed with medical assistance in dying or be aware of that, it's quite a challenge. So one of the ways that we've worked around that is to say that the social workers can provide the information to the client. The client then would have to receive those services outside of that hospital. So that was brought up as being an issue, and so we have to make sure that the clients have access to the information and, and they have a right to that information. They have a right to being able to be aware of it, but the people, nurses, doctors, social workers, OTs, whoever it might be in that hospital, will not be the ones that provide the service. So I don't know if that kind of gets at it, but as those issues come up, you need to figure out ways to balance both legislation, the employer's, you know, choices, rights, expectations, our values, they all need to be considered. Excellent. Well, I, I'm really thankful uh, that you have committed to uh, this being a three-part series because I know uh, in the next two parts you'll introduce some tools and probably I know we're going to work through some uh, an ethical dilemma. And I think from our perspective here on the national level, it's not being a regulatory body but the National Association voice. Uh, we often will get questions uh, from social workers on ethics uh, and uh, uh, and just how to move people through the ethical decision making is always something that is is very difficult uh, uh, when uh, when we're not a regulatory body but we we are the holder of the national code of ethics uh, and so I, I am thankful uh, thankful for this because uh, it is often difficult to answer the questions and I find and, and maybe I'll ask you this question from my own uh, I find and often when I'm having a conversation with somebody about ethics, um, they are already know the answer to their question, but they are seeking uh, uh, an outside opinion to affirm that. And so in your experience, uh, you alluded earlier to teams or working in teams or, uh, to discuss ethics, uh, but in these situations where people are trying to work through, what's your recommendations to them on how, how, how they can work through it or if there are resources that there might be out there to help them work through it. Well, oh, that's a great one. I often find when a social worker comes in to see me for supervision, 
that's usually in and of itself some kind of, um, there's something that's worrying them, right? Something that's bothering them, something that doesn't feel yeah, right. Yeah. And um, so I give them credit for, you know, being willing to come forward and say, this doesn't feel good. I, I don't know what to do. I don't, what's my next steps? And so then one of the things that we will talk about in Module 3 is an actual framework um, to kind of work through some of those challenges. So as a supervisor, what I try to do now is incorporate some of those questions into my practice so that there is that safety, that comfort for the social worker to have a chance to kind of reflect on what it is that's worrying them or bothering them, what are they struggling with, what do they think is the right thing to do, and just kind of work through some of those things together. And usually in the end, you know, they come up with an outcome that feels comfortable for them and that, um, you know, honors their clients' wishes and practices. So we will talk about that a little bit more. Um, I've recently, um, just because I've been reflecting so much on ethics and standards of practice, I've actually kind of pulled out the standards of practice a couple of times while we've been debating an issue and say it, and say to myself, so let, let's let's look and see what does the Manitoba College of Social Workers standards of practice say about uh, this issue? Is there anything in there? Will that provide us with any kind of guidance or suggestion about what we could or should do? So that's what, another tool that I would encourage people to take a look at and to have handy. Um, and then there's, you know, different websites out there. And I mean, that's one of the ones that we'll introduce to you in Module 3. But uh, the Manitoba FEN Network has lots of ethical frameworks. They also have lots of um, ethical scenarios that... Um, are presented kind of in a bit of a story format and then people can kind of see what others have um, done in those situations. And I can't remember the name of it, but there's also a journal. I'm just looking through my notes here. A journal for um, social workers that um, has different ethical uh, articles that comes out on a monthly basis where you can get kind of the table of contents and that often is, you know, our evidence-based practice uh, material that um, can help us work through some of our dilemmas. Perfect. I'll, I can commit to people on the on the call. I mean, on the presentation and others that will uh, will look based on your recommendations and working back and forth with you on the next two uh, webinars. We'll, we'll we'll post some of these resources yeah. up on the CSW website. Now, this Great. next question might be a little bit difficult to ask and puts you in a little bit of a spot, but this is what ethics are all about. So, uh, if if ethics embody right, wrong, and it depends, the, the gray area, then how can social workers fundamentally be uh, reprimanded? I'm assuming that is a reference to uh, regulation. Mm-hmm. Yes, I don't, I mean, I think, I think what we need to do is we need to take a look at our code of ethics, our standards, our practice, and we need to reflect on our choices that we've made. And I mean, I would hope as a supervisor, I would approach my social worker and ask them an open-ended question. What happened in this situation? What were your choices? Why did you make those choices? And um, if there is a difference in opinion, I think I would try and have that conversation and let the person know what I'm concerned about. And we would have to have that ethical debate. But there are also you know, certain expectations when it comes to me as an employer and expectations that I would have for my staff as an employer. So I have to take all of those things into consideration. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so, very much so. Uh, just for uh, people, uh, just a heads up, we are going probably in the next few minutes going to end this, uh, this webinar. So if you have any last burning questions, uh, please put, the, put them in. Uh, in, the ter in terms of housekeeping for people, because there's a few more questions on, uh, on uh, whether this presentation and others will be on our website, all three of these uh, presentations and webinars in which Vicki has uh, uh, very much has uh, lent her time in which we're hugely appreciative of uh, her lending her, her, her expertise and her time to 
us, both in developing uh, the uh, presentations for us, but also delivering them. Uh, and uh, so all three of the webinars, uh, they're, they're going to be put live, but they'll also all be onto our website as well as the PowerPoints after the events. Uh, and there is uh, one comment uh, for you, uh, Vicki, in the sense of uh, looking ahead to the subsequent sessions and uh, uh, Fiona asking if we could look at the ethics of whistleblowing may maybe possibly being discussed uh, in, uh, in future webinars, and that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I have one last question here, unless something else comes in. I've been saving the, uh, this one to the end, and so what would you say uh, there is, uh, would you say there is one social work value ethic that is uh, the most important to practice? <laughs> well, I could answer that for sure, but then that would be coming from my value base, right? I so, so that I mean, I think that's what it's all about. Again, I mean, uh, I've done this self-reflection activity before and felt pretty confident about what my top four values are and why they are. And then I've gone into a room of people who've done the same, and I've listened to their arguments about why one particular value is more important than another. And I think, oh, hmm, yeah, that makes sense. So I, I don't feel comfortable answering that because, yeah, it would be coming from my own value base. Very good. Uh, there is a couple questions. Uh, a lot of people, uh, rather than questions, are just so you know, uh, my uh, my Q and A screen has exploded with uh, very interesting and thank you very much, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. So there's a whole lot of thank yous for you, Vicky. And uh, uh, another person is asking is there's be confirmation of attendance. Uh, if you need confirmation, uh, you can uh, email CSW at CSW-ACTS.ca. Uh, we don't uh, give certificates of, a pre of, uh, of uh, attendance, uh, but if you need it, uh, I can send you an email saying that uh, I can see who has attended and who hasn't if you want that for your records. Um, and so at this point, I would like to, again, very much thank you, Vicki, uh, as well as the Manitoba College of Social Workers who have partnered with us uh, to put on this three-part, uh, very, very much needed, I think, three-part series on ethics. And uh, for those in the audience today, uh, the next webinar series in this series will be uh, March 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And again, a recording of the PowerPoint and the video will be up on the website. Vicki, thank you very much. I look very much forward to uh, having uh, the next two in this series, and um, thank you again. Okay, Everybody, thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.